and I just recently joined uh, Online Lab. And I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, some of the future directions uh, regarding the architecture of ONOS as it moves towards the open source. So first of all, let me disclaim it with uh, um, disclaim it. It's not by any means a certain thing yet. Okay, we want to. We know that there are certain things that need to happen for open source, but we have a limited amount of time, and it's unclear whether we will get all of them accomplished. However, so what I'm presenting right now is sort of the um, the plan of intent, but it is not committed yet. Um, now, some of these things will be achieved. It's just not clear whether all of them will be achieved. So, what are the things that we hope, from an architectural runway perspective, to accomplish by November? So, first of all, is to accomplish protocol independence. Uh, we've had a number of people asking for it. Um, I'm going to explain exactly why, but it, it is extremely important to accomplish this. Uh, another one is to um, attain um, code modularity. Uh, today, the uh, ONOS code base, even though there are substructures within it and clearly subsystems and boundaries within it, from a software code base structure standpoint, it's, it's really just one source tree. And um, while that yields certain amount of simplicity, it will propose barriers for uh, contributing code back and for deployment and other, there's other issues with it. We also want to abandon the floodlight loading modules. Yes, it's simple. It comes from floodlight. Yes, a lot of people are familiar with it, but it is a barrier to dynamic extensibility. No, I'm not necessarily talking about hot swappability. That's one of the benefits, but that's one of the selling, the last selling points. Okay, we, this is all about being able to build a system that does what you want it to do without having to necessarily build the whole system from scratch every single time. We also want to, as part of the uh, protocol independence, we want to introduce a new southbound API. And we also want to, as part of this rework and polishing, we want to introduce a revised northbound API. That, um, and I will talk more about that. So those are the rough level high-level goals for the architect from the architectural runway standpoint. Okay, so why do we want why do we care about protocol independence? Well, we want to be able to support different versions of OpenFlow protocol uh, going forward, new versions, or potentially even, you know, if there's a faster, better library, why not? Um, mm -hmm. Why not be able to support different protocols altogether? Metcon for certain things, TL1 for other things. Um, we certainly have uh, heard requests for the same uh, from many different vendors and partners. Also, we would like to uh, decouple and uh, um, de uh, so liberate the applications and actually the core itself, the core of the system itself, from dealing with protocol-specific nuances. There's no reason that it needs to. Things like tables and uh, dealing with flow conflicts. Um, you know, last but not least, and this is not FUD, clearly you know, panic-driven decisions are never good ones, but the, uh, definitely we would like to preempt negative perception and comparisons against ODL. ODL does have protocol independence today. It may have other issues, but it does have protocol independence and we should have it too. Um, why do we care about code-based uh, code modularity? Um, well, so we want to do a couple of things with ONOS, and this is what we've been stri uh, striving to do so far, is to allow partners to deliver various solutions based on ONOS. And of course, coming in November, we also would like to have the partners be able to contribute back into ONOS code base. But we want to do both of these things without speciating the ONOS code base. And the only way to do that is if there's, you know, neatly um, defined and crisply defined boundaries within which contributions can be confined and within which experimentations can occur. And of course we also want to do it to increase and to continue to maintain architectural coherence. You know, we have, we have a pretty sound architecture in terms of the philosophy of it and, and the structure of the system. We just need to make sure that we can codify this in a code base and preserve it in a code base. Uh, one of the uh, sort of attributes of a single code base is it's prone to rise in cyclic dependencies. And so we want to modularize the code base to, sprawl, to control these sprawls and to confine them. And this is especially important again because if we open the code to, to community, 
uh, it, that's going to uh, cause more turmoil and this is one way to sort of provide firewalls so that cyclic dependencies don't enter the system. And again, ODL today has code, mo code modularity. Now, it's a pile of modules. It would not necessarily have a coherent structure on which those modules hang. So just being modular doesn't mean it's, it's good. Um, but we, I think modularity is necessary. It's just not sufficient. So because it's necessary, we want to be we want to be modular. So roughly speaking, this is what we want to accomplish. And roughly speaking, this is what ONOS has today. It's just we want to make sure that it has the boundaries between the tiers more crisply defined and physically enforced. So up at the top, we have applications. Up at the bottom, we have various network elements. The network elements, um, we interact, the ONOS interacts with the network elements with the use of different protocols. Today, it's primarily um, open flow. And then it supplies the information to the, to, the, to the system. So what we would like to do is have the south-oriented concerns to be isolated in the provider tier, whose responsibility is to absorb the protocol-specific differences, collect information in whatever ways it can or needs to, and supply that information through a structured API and protocol agnostic API to the core. Providers can largely remain completely oblivious to, net, uh, to cluster uh, awareness. They may choose to be cluster aware, but for the most part they should not have to. Core, on the other hand, takes on responsibilities of um, maintaining the network information model, maintaining its coherency and consistency, persistency, and then distributing that model uh, both through synchronous means and asynchronous means via the northbound API to consumers. So roughly speaking, that's the tiering that we want to accomplish. And just because these are big boxes, core is a big box and providers is a big box, that does not mean it's monolithic. It's still faceted, and I'll talk more about that later. So, so the ONOS core, the, the function of the ONOS core, core is to expose the network information upwards and a protocol agnostic northbound API for applications who can synchronously deal with it or can asynchronously uh, be notified when changes happen through listener pattern. To the south, it exposes protocol agnostic southbound API through which a, uh, providers can inject information about the net network environment to the core and also across in a downwards direction uh, across which API the providers can receive edicts from the north. So do this or push this flow and that sort of stuff but it's done in protocol agnostic way. And both of the APIs are protocol agnostic. Okay. Uh, ONOS core is then responsible for cluster coordination and replication of any data that needs to be replicated, but then it can be in control, full control over how the data is replicated. Is it replicated? Is it distributed? Is it distributed in a very directed fashion between a master and slaves? It's entirely its concern. Providers don't need to know this. A core is also responsible for any persistence uh, uh, requirements. Uh, so if there is important edicts like uh, intents, you know, if an application says I would like to um, have, you know, I, have an, I would like to provision a point-to-point -point connectivity from here to here, that's a high-level intent, uh, we should certainly remember it, right? Um, similarly, there may be uh, select uh, sensory data that, of importance that we would like to remember. Metrics, potentially, um, alerts, potentially, I don't know. So if you choose to persist it, that would be the job of the core. Providers should not be persisting stuff, period. <coughs> and the idea at the core, again, I mentioned this before just because it's drawn on a diagram of tiers as one big blob. Uh, it doesn't mean it's monolithic. It's still the idea is that it's modular, and then it can potentially be horizontally extended over time in terms of by adding new functionalities. Let's say uh, logical networks. We don't have that today. Maybe maybe there's a use case for it. Do you have a question, David? Do you see the providers be able to express levels of persistence back to the core, saying, "Hey, this is please persist this for this instance." or for a time period, but if it shuts down, I don't care if I lose it, versus I need this really persisted over system startup? Um, and no, I don't, but I think maybe we're not, I think, I haven't conveyed exactly what providers are intended right. for. Um, 
in a capacity that I think of them, they shouldn't have to say. The either the, it's the nature of the data that the core decides whether it's important or not, and the provider supply certain so the core is making those decisions. The core is making those decisions. And if you want to extend the core with certain behaviors, you can do that. Though we typically expect extensions and and, and contributions to be happening around in the provider layer, because the core is just one. There is only one subsystem for dealing with devices. There's no no need to have two different subsystems dealing with it, just one. You know, if, if that's the authority for uh, keeping track of the inventory of infrastructure devices. And are the apps allowed access to any of that persistence so, to, to augment data? So, I can hold it. Again, yes. <laughs> so what is, what is an app versus what is a solution? And uh, so apps right now are things that are sitting on top of the API and using the API. So. Um, but you could have solutions which comprises of a little bit of an app up at the top, but also a little bit of a, a custom provider and maybe a little bit of a core code. Okay. So it's more of a philosophical uh, seg segmentation. Um, the apps, even though we confine them in a diagram up at the top, the solutions can com consist of code at either of the levels. Okay. Um, so some attributes of the core southbound and northbound API. So, so it's delivered, we expect it to be delivered in a unified form as a single bundle. So you're not going to actually, there's a southbound API, northbound API. It's actually going to be one bundle, but there will be logical separation within them. This, is, this, is, this function is intended for providers, this is intended for consumers. It's, um, the reason we're revising the northbound API because we would like it to be delivered with consistent pattern and nomenclature to simplify its usage. Also along the same line, it's, it's, on, it's today, it's abstraction driven. Uh, it's not model driven, it's abstraction driven. And we, can't, we intend to keep it that way. And it's going to be abstraction driven for simplicity of use and also for stability of the API. Now it has some downsides, model driven has some benefits, but uh, we're going to stick with the abstract, uh, abstraction group. Um, the, the various services of the API, again, are sort of faceted around topics like devices, paths, topologies, intents, and so forth. Uh, so, so even though it's delivered in a unified form, there's still nice compartments, uh, and nomenclature will enforce that. Um, and and uh, the, the way the southbound API is structured, it it sort of enforces the separation of concerns between core and providers by by insisting that core is protocol agnostic, will remain protocol agnostic in terms of dealing, it will not be dealing with any protocol specific items. Now, there may be protocol specific behavior that resembles protocol specifics. Like, for example, clearly the flow notion of match actions or flow rules. Uh, that's sort of one, one hears that they think open flow. So yeah, there will be a notion for that, but it will not be tied to any specific protocol library. Um, and also, we would like to enable the providers. We're not going, we're not, we're not going to force them to be pro uh, cluster unaware. We're not going to do that, but we're going to uh, encourage them to remain locally concerned with the local only concerns. <coughs> so they don't have to deal with the complexities of distributed system, unless they choose to do so. So uh, the, the network model, uh, I mean, it's going to revolve around the following nouns of the you know, devices, and this is no different than what it is today. Again, it's just going to be uh, cleaned up a little bit for consistency in nomenclature, and also to strip away some of the protocol specifics that may have leaked into ONOS over time. Uh, notion of devices, infrastructure devices, the interior vertices in a graph, the hosts as the exterior uh, vertices of the network graph, the links which are interior edges, hosts, links which are the exterior edges, path, the representation of paths as a, as a uh, now this doesn't mean actually something that's been provisioned, this is just an abstract chain of contiguous links which, which uh, visit uh, progress, uh, contiguous link of uh, infrastructure devices, which means you cannot have a path that has hops from one device completely different device. Uh, topology is a representation of the network graph. So uh, one of the enhancements that is going into um, ONOS, um, started to go into ONOS um, for um, oh, sorry, August, was the notion of a topology as a consistent snapshot. So 
So once you have a topology, you have a consistent snapshot. Now that snapshot may be invalidated, but you can still at least have a sort of this almost an immutable entity that you can <coughs> uh, analyze. So we will we will carry that forward and build on that. Um, how does the uh, multi-layer play into that network model we have there when I'm going, you know, not just linking between devices, but I'm changing layers and Transform, layer transform before it forward on to the next device. We haven't worked all of that stuff out, but it's likely going to be captured by uh, by either the ports themselves being able to be stacked on top of each other, or uh, um, or uh, through also links. But we have not discussed that with the team yet. We're just starting on the server. Um, so, so actually, so link is always a hard layer, maybe it's a low layer, maybe the transfer. I was multiple paths, you know, I mean, the multiple link. So, link, uh, I, I don't know, so in the high layer, maybe in the low layer, maybe the, the path. So, I mean, so is the, I think it's a. I'm not sure I understand it. I'm not sure. Oh, sorry, so I'm in sure. Multi layer, let's say the multi layer environment, so mm -hmm. link concept is uh, in mm -hmm. the IP layer, is the IP link, but then uh, in the optic layer, maybe the it's optic a path. path, optic path. Mm -hmm. So, how to model, I mean, in the, the same ob object, so, I mean, so, so you, well, I, I don't want to augur in on, on the details, so we haven't, first of all, we haven't worked out all of the details yet, but those are some of the, because we do want to support the optical use case, those are some of the discussions we will continue to have. But the idea is to be able to capture, the answer is yes, the idea is to be able to capture the layered topology, one way or another, we haven't figured out exactly how. Uh, two possibilities that I mentioned was to, to do it through links themselves by having uh, a specific attributes so that we can actually use the links and recognize them as belonging to a different layer. Okay. Another one is because the links comprise of two different connect pair, connect points. I mean, the connect point is essentially a pair of a, uh, the device ID and port number. And the port numbers themselves can be stacked. Essentially, you could have a port number that realizes another port, logical port. And so we have not explored it or have those discussions yet. Those are different approaches that I've seen used. So I don't have an answer for you, uh, but on how it's going to be done. But the idea is to be able to deal with it. Yes. And are you you're taking into account tenants? Really tenants? Not right now. Okay. No, no tenants. Just for simplicity. Okay. Um, tenants complicate things tremendously. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> right now, start simple. Okay. Especially given the fact that this is for November, <laughs> well, for November, and and our on our focus is for WANs right now, which yeah. is basically the network is in the control of a single, um, single authority. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, there's no notion of a flow rule as a match action pair going, you know, apply to a device. So, so that's all That's all in on us today. Again, it will just be polished for nomenclature and for consistency in patterns, and, and both in the model and the APIs. You know, clearly, um, there's a, you know, one of sort of the highest level of the API is the intent and intent service, which allows us to capture, which allows an application to specify what it wants to do, uh, provided the system's capable of doing it. Um, and, and in a way where it specifies what is to be done, not how it's to be done. Um, and the intent framework, the way it's been designed, is, as Toshi mentioned earlier, was to allow it to be extensible. So initially, we will be focused only on basic connectivity type events, uh, where we say, I would like to, for traffic that looks like this, to go from here to there. Not, we don't specify how or from this point to these many points, or from these many points to this point, and so forth. Um, uh, eventually, we expect that additional uh, types of intents, the more policy level intents, can be, um, can be encoded, or the system can be extended with. And, and the, the built-in intents are registered, uh, um, are supported using the same extensibility mechanism that others can use. You can provide your own compilers, you can provide your own installers. And there's traceability from intents to flow rolling back? That's the idea, yes. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of a rough high-level inventory of the various ONOS modules that we will deliver as essentially OSGI bundles. So we have 
uh, one API bundle, uh, one or more core bundles. We have not fi figured out how we're going to segment it yet, uh, for sh for certain. Um, uh, the uh, number of uh, OpenFlow provider bundles. So Onus will come with the default OpenFlow providers, just as it does today. Um, it, they're just going to be separated from the rest of the system, and uh, whether or not a, a partner or a vendor wants to continue to use those or sub supplant them with different ones, that's entirely their own choice. Um, one of the benefits of going with the OSGI framework and well, one of the benefits of drop kicking the, the floodlight loading framework is because not only it has this poor man's uh, container and, and class loading, but it also has poor man's REST API, which is not really, does not provide for any security, it does not use a standard way of coding. We would like to uh, use JAX RS, which is a standard way of coding uh, RESTful APIs. Um, same thing for the, the GUI. The GUI should be built on top of RESTful APIs or web sockets and needs to be a separate web archive. The, today it's already separate, our GUI is separate, but I think it needs to be brought into the fold, but yet kept, you know, uh, be under the umbrella but kept separate. Also, uh, the idea here is to facilitate debugging uh, and administration with Apache Caraf, which is the intended OSGI container. Um, it has a very nice extensible command line shell, which you can use both in local console as well as for remote console with security via SSH and whatnot. So here we're basically just completely borrowing and leveraging what it offers and with just by supplying small tiny segments of Java code that are built on top of the API, we can provide uh, um, very easy CLIs with command co with argument completion and everything else. And so it, it, that will come in extremely handy during well, for, our, for ourselves when debugging and uh, developing the system as well as for administrators. So that that will be a um, set of module, a set of there will be a module that will deliver, deliver a set of CLIs. Um, we also clearly have an OpenFlow subsystem, which we, that was actually one of the first things that we sort of separated from uh, from everything else in Onos. That is de delivered as two set of bundles: API, which contains the message libraries and the API itself, and the the con o Onos OFCTL, which provides the I/O subsystem. That's the active part that manages the connections of OpenFlow switches and and uh, shuttling the messages back and forth. And of course, we will most likely also deliver a number of uh, various domain agnostic utilities as one or more bundles um, that are carry slightly different name, on map dash something. So that's high level module inventory that we expect to deliver in <laughs> November. Yes, go ahead. You, you talked about solutions, I'm sorry. You talked about solutions later on where there's a bits of the app at the top yes. level bits of the app and the yes. core. Um, and then you talk about REST APIs. So when I have a solution such as that, mm -hmm. is there a framework to augment the existing core REST APIs, or am I just writing normal JAX code? But if I'm just writing JAX code, how is there, how, is there any consistency? How do you so, um, so this code will be open source. We intend it to be clean code, mm -hmm. which means it will be documented. It will have tests, tests with it. And uh, it should follow uh, best practices guidelines, which is it will follow the best practices from JAX RS. You can yep. take a look at it. Yep. The, the built-in REST APIs will be delivered as one bundle. Yep. So that will be the ONOS V1 or whatever we decide to name it. And that will be a namespace of resources and verbs that you can do by default. If you choose to do some additional stuff or want to have REST API for some additional services that have been put on ONOS, you just deliver your own RESTful bundle. Now it'll have a different prefix, it will not share the same namespace, but it should follow the same patterns and it should be very consistent. So okay. it could be ONOS something something V1. Okay. The idea is to just use a standard uh, web context segregation between the different namespaces. Uh, unless you want to contribute the code back and, and it falls into the sort of this built-in satisfy this built-in criteria, then, then, then you could actually contribute to the ONOS REST bundle. That's also a possible code. So that's just high-level um, module inventory, uh, just a rough-level dependency d depiction. Uh, everything interacts through interfaces, and so the, everything should be in glued together using the APIs. So you should, you should not see any solid lines between, uh, between the blue boxes. 
The idea is that uh, Onos API is exposed for others to consume. Core needs the API to implement it. The providers need the API so they can supply the southbound uh, you know, information via southbound API. Uh, open flow providers, of course, also need the open flow subsystem API and so forth. You, you get the picture. The dotted line here, uh, they signify implied uh, dependency at runtime. So clearly, you need to have the two different implementations present in order for something to happen. But they're not direct dependencies in the sense that, uh, um, the, let's say, Onos OF provider is not directly aware of Onos Core nor OS, or, or Onos OF CTL. It's just standard OSGI Maven-based practices, good practices. Thomas, is there a requirement for access control for the APIs in terms of um, well, I don't know. I don't know whether there's a requirement or not. But my stance uh, uh, with respect to the security: let's first secure the external doors, uh, and those would be the doors to the south to make sure that the uh, switches connect to the, via TLS or whatnot, um, so that we can secure the southbound protocol uh, facet, so that we can secure the REST and GUI facets, which are the web external interfaces. Uh, or any administrative uh, CLI stuff, which is already secure, by the way. And with for web, I'm not at all worried because that that's we just use standard filter security. That's not rocket science. That's also one of the benefits and motivators for going with the different REST framework, because it's nearly impossible to secure using the what's there in floodlight, um, or you have to use very esoteric means. Um, with uh, with respect to the um, internal job <coughs> APIs as to who can access which service that we have not worked it out yet uh, right now all of the internal doors are left unlocked that's how it is today and that's most likely how it will be in no on November and then we will probably have to explore ways there's definitely a requirement for it in my opinion but I think we should first worry about the outer doors then we'll worry about the inner doors you know you can put the we can put the door on the bathroom later. The lock on the bathroom later. I know. Right now we sort of assume assume uh, uh, some uh, some uh, some uh, some reasonable behaviors. With once you're running on a, on appliance, you're inherently trusted already, right. right? Because you can do pretty much whatever you want anyway. Uh, so there's really po little point in securing it. it. But but the idea is to eventually do. Uh, but Dana was also worried about the priority. Prioritizing some of the APIs and what APIs are higher priority than others in terms of getting a trigger application capabilities. Yeah, so there's, like I said, right now an application can do uh, either inadvertently or maliciously, can pretty much do anything. And so once we allow presence on, on the controller, as I think one of the use cases asked for that, I mean, I think there's many use cases that ask for it, um, it's free for all. Um, what is the performance implication to move to moving to OSGI? OSGI. What is the implication or oh, motivation? On performance. Any void impact? Oh, impact. okay. Yeah, I don't know where it comes from. People say OSGI is heavy. If you use it right, uh, um, it's basically a local procedure call. There's no intervening stack proxies whatsoever, and all, it's just we're using it essentially as a module loading, which I'm not sure how it can be heavy, um, and also for auto wiring, for component wiring, which is no different than Spring or, well, it's actually much more lightweight than J2E, but it's, I would arguably, it's as light as is as uh, Juice or as Spring. Uh, and as far as code-wise, <coughs> what co amount of code one has to write to do that, it's actually the least costly of them all. It's actually least costly than juice to write, because you don't have to write, you just write one line annotation for each dependency that yeah, you want to interject when, it. When, from one, one, one bundle you're calling another bundle, in that, yeah. all, is there any overhead? So no, that is what a lot of time no, people no, have I, I have no idea where, I have from. no idea where that comes from. I don't know why. Yeah, you, you can touch a debugger and trace it, and there's nothing. There's nothing there. there. Is no extra it's a local. It's a local. It's a lo lo no, that's a local procedure call. That's it. So that is where the confusion comes from. I, I I don't know, and I don't know where that perception, uh, the fact that it's heavy, comes from. I do not know. 
also the model you showed, that's the uh, plan. This one? No, 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 uh, oh, this. Yes, yeah, these models are protocol agnostic. Yeah, yes. How you how you absorb the difference of the, the software? So uh, that's that's clearly the art here in modeling, right? Uh, you, if you model every single nuance of a, of the real thing, then you will not have modeled anything. Yeah. Uh, right. Because if you expose every single bump, and uh, then it's a problem. But if, on the other hand, if you sandpaper it too much and 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 round it out too much, then you, the thing no longer resembles. The, the thing that you want to represent. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea here is to capture the right details and the right amount of detail. Uh, we, we certainly gonna try to do that. It's uh, I think Onos is already doing that to a degree, and uh, the idea is just to refine it. Okay. Um, so as long as the attribute, that you can put anything in attribute. To so, yeah. So we have not figured out yet whether we will for November. Most likely not for November. Uh, support uh, extensibility through attributes, so you can key value pair type attributes. So right now, most likely, the, the API will be fairly uh, s uh, static in a sense that these are the attributes we can capture and that's it. Um, the, we've discussed in, um, I forget which conversations uh, and meetings here, whether or not we need to support extensibility through key value pair type extension. The idea here is to strike a balance between having it to be too rigid and uh, and it being too elastic. Because if it's too elastic, where anything goes, then it's the the whole there's no abstraction. The whole yeah. thing devolves into a amorphous pile, and and it becomes very difficult for the applications or the consumers of that model to um, to know what's what. For example, the device, hopefully, a switch router, maybe a circuit switch, maybe a WDM switch, a rodent, those kinds of things we will be able to model, right? And yeah, yeah, they don't have to be separated. I mean, uh, they have to have those distinct. Yeah, things. so the thought here is that this is the device is a device. It will have a type uh, that will, high level type, that will identify it as a, I think that's a, that's switch. a, that's a switch. That's a router. It's really just not, 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 it's just a rough classification. There's a, the device itself, this is, um, the model entities in here are not to, um, they're carriers of information. They're not carriers of behavior. That's one distinction. It's not object oriented in this way. Uh, the, 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 the behaviors will be, be absorbed in the services mm -hmm. and will be driven by the amount, by the nature of data within those of ca carrier objects. Is it valuable to look at devices? I mean, call it switch router here, but rather than an entity name, more of a capability, because a device might have more than one capability. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I might have a device no. that is a switch no, and no. a router. Yeah, yeah, so that's why I said it's a device, it's a, it's a thing. The, the device in here, and, and just like hosts yeah. and other things, are carriers of information right. about a thing. But they do not carry any behaviors implicit. However, they could have behaviors attached to them. Right. Um, and that, that, that's where I think that element tag, or that, that mm -hmm. you, know, you, you just use the example switching a router, those are capabilities this device has. Yes, and this is exactly the attachment point for, for attaching the driver code that yeah. absorbs yeah. the yeah. <laughs> I saw that coming. <laughs> okay, so, uh, um, but but I, yeah, so that was actually a good question because that hits on on what the model is and versus what it isn't. Yeah. So it is definitely sort of abstraction and slash service oriented. Um, it's really not as much object oriented. Now, of course, we use object orientation heavily, but I think we use it appropriately. I don't think this is a place to use object orientation. So the device, uh, like a switch and router, I mean, is a, is a kind, kind of present the virtual switch, a virtual router, and, um, and the big switch, a big router, something like huh? that? So, yeah, so um, device is a device, but it can be hosted by another device. The, the idea is to capture the hosted by relationship, meaning that you could, the, the idea is to, to be able to eventually uh, allow for recognizing a bare metal box as a device. Okay. And then also be able to recognize the fact that it may have an open flow instance on, on portion of the device. Okay, thanks. And then, it, so we might see the two, we might see the device twice. We might see it as the open flow instance, 
or maybe we could see it three times because we may have two open flow instances on VLAN blue and VLAN red. Uh, and there's two different open flow instances that are both realized by the same physical <laughs> top of the, the rack switch. Uh, so we might actually see three devices, but okay. two of them will be hosted by the other. Uh, now, again, for November, we will not likely to have this. Okay. The, the idea, and again, philosophy that I'd uh, like to adopt here is to, if you're not sure about it, don't put it in. Because it needs to be a minimal API. It needs to be necessary and sufficient minimal API. And if you're not certain about something, not put it in because uh, if you put it in, even as a placeholder saying, hey, see, we're thinking about this, it, it only causes problems because if it's not reasonably cooked um, and we feel that we're going to have to change it later, um, well, then we have to trespass into the territory of breaking the API compatibility. And clearly, you know, we're reaching the point where we can't take that lightly. So the idea is, if you're not sure, don't put it in, and we can always, because it's always easier to add things than it is to change things or remove things. That's the thought. So you, you might not see certain things that you would expect there, but that doesn't mean that they could not be there added later. We have only three months, and so, and, and right now we have a single code base. We're going to, we have already started on, on defining the Southbound API. We've already started on uh, revising the Northbound API, and we've started, and we have actually <coughs> segmented source structure in which we have ported a portion, the lower portions of Onos controller but we have much, much work ahead. And we also have other use cases that we need to pursue, and which is where my disclaimer comes from. Right now, what I present here is the, is the objectives that I would like to accomplish, but, but it, it is not 100% clear how much of this can be accomplished. I'm hoping as much as possible because it will be difficult to make drastic changes after November. So at a high level, that's, that's, that's what I have. If there's any questions, I don't know how much time I've used of it. Questions? Yes. So the so the for the for the virtual network. So the I know it's a but we wait within this uh, three months is probably too short to implement or support any uh, virtual uh, network. What's your uh, the uh, consideration and visions? How the owners class or eventually support the virtual network? You don't mind. Virtual network, as in overlays, virtual overlays like tunnels. The and overlay is just a kind of the technology. No, I understand. Uh, yeah, but yeah. but uh, so, okay. kind of so like, well, the idea is definitely to support it, and also uh, also along with that would go the ability to support NFV. At least notion of uh, of notions of NFV devices, so that we can, as part of the intent framework, so that we can establish, for example, uh, a sort of a not really a path intent as much so, because path intent is more get traffic from point to point A to point B, but rather almost like a transformation intent, so that you can specify in your intentions. Traffic that looks like this needs to go to scrubber, needs to go to, uh, you know, needs to go uh, to be put on a tag with this uh, NPLS tag or whatnot, and then, and then send on away. So there is a chain of almost like a processing chain. Right now, we're nowhere near getting to that, but yeah, that's one. Of, I, would, I would think that would be something we would be aiming for. We would definitely will not be there in November. But again, just because it's not here doesn't mean it's not possible. We have to, we have to tackle these foundational, you know, network awareness and network foundational network control. Be able to see what the network looks like, even if it's a physical network only, and be able to exercise control over that physical network in a very deliberate way and be aware of how the network reacts. So, you know, for example, uh, support for flow statistics should be in there, and that's actually um, spelled out in here. Okay. So the um, and other uh, question is, uh, you just said is uh, in the core, we're going to do the protocol agnostic, right? So the, could you cl clarify that again? I have a case, basically we need the core aware of the tunnel types. 
So there's the GRE tunnels, there's the MPRS tunnels, and uh, all those tunnels, right? So, so ah. in such cases, uh, ah, that's a, the that's protocol a agnostic. No, no, that's not that's not what I meant. So okay. protocol agnostic means it's actually when we are collecting information from the. So the, it's the protocols that we use to collect an information from the network or observe the network and to exercise control over the network. That doesn't necessarily mean the protocols uh, about the network. The protocols in the database. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's definitely, we, we certainly want to be aware of those. Okay. Like, you know, we, that, that for sure. Okay. We want to allow visibility to that. So, uh, because, I mean, we certainly want to know about things like MPLS, about BGP, or about, uh, um, about uh, VXLAN or MVGRE or whatnot. So, so how's that work? You talked about the AT&T case where they had the MPLS cloud earlier, and really conceptually the intent, if you will, was, was adjacency. Mm -hmm. And then how that adjacency got implemented, <coughs> technology specific, but should almost be driven by policy. In this deployment it may be MPLS, in this deployment it may be something else. So the question is in terms of your abstraction model, are you thinking more along adjacencies and then uh, applying policy down kind of as you push down? Or are you really thinking about doing abstraction models around specific technologies like MPLS? Um, I'm trying to digest the question here. I'll make sure I understand it. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm trying to say something. I mean, with the startup life, I mean, you can think and then you get okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> so, I guess in the context of the the AT and T thing, this overlay based stuff that uh, Tom talked about, there you will have to layer something else on top of Onos, some kind of a virtualization or something that abstracts the network even more. In the context of Onos, the idea is to present the entire network view to the application running on top of that. If you want to take the entire MPLS network and represent that as a crossbar or as a cross -bar, <coughs> then something else needs to be layered on top of ONOS that will abstract it and present it that way. Or if you go down, I mean, you know, another way, I don't know whether you're familiar with our OVX platform, where you run that platform right on top of the physical infrastructure, and then on that physical infrastructure, you can create different virtual networks, and you can specify what type of topology or abstraction you want. And then uh, you could do that. Like on ODX, you can say, give me the, this whole network where I want the presentation as a, one single big switch. And you could potentially do that. But that is an even more different way of doing it than maybe what one could do on top of it. I got to digest that. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I think what you were asking is that in that MPLS cloud, if you want to create a VXLAN tunnel or maybe some other technology tunnel, right? That's oh, okay. Yeah. And that can be represented. How you create that mm -hmm. tunnel from ONOPS, okay, that's protocol agnostic, right? So I think that's what, the, oh, you know, okay. how you tell the device. How, how, I tell you, own, well, how I tell my controller. I want to create essentially an adjacency across a cloud, right? Oh. The MPLS cloud. I want to. I want to create. So I've got device here, big cloud device here. I just. I want to go from A to B, essentially an adjacency across the cloud. That's the. In, that's the intent, right? That's now. the intent. <laughs> the question is, when I start pushing things down and modeling my abstractions, you had talked about modeling MPLS. I'm like. You know, the abstraction layer, are we modeling that technology MPLS or are we modeling a uh, adjacency and then applying kind of an implementation policy down below the abstraction layer to map the abstraction to a specific technology? So it's really where are you, where are you where's the technology yeah. abstraction? Right. I, think, that kind of I, think, I think in the new intent framework, that technology abstraction comes from what we call compilers. Yeah. Right? So the intent is ex expressed as an abstraction from point A to point B. Now how that point A to point B gets resolved or compiled into a particular technology implementation <coughs> comes from that compilers. And you can plug in different compilers, right? So you can plug in a compiler that will create a Mac-based tunnel. You can plug in a compiler that creates an MPLS tunnel or a, or a VXLAN tunnel and so on, right? Because I'm also trying to think about how you create the MPLS cloud to start with in the controller. And you're like saying, really, I want to create a bunch of adjacencies between these five points, and then, you know, that creates my MPLS cloud. Oh, I see. Um, well, in a, you know, as far as the tunnel, the tunnels are yeah. specific, regardless of type. Yeah. Uh, as far as that's concerned, 
again, that probably won't be there in uh, mm -hmm. November, mm -hmm. yeah. but we had discussions, uh, in-depth discussions with Huawei, mm -hmm. with Patrick, about the need to do that and to be able to track the channels, regardless of, uh, in a protocol agnostic way, but still be aware of what type they are, uh, so that they can properly be, so that they can, we can properly dispatch control to, um, to the appropriate providers. Yeah, so, th th because there might be technology specific behaviors or potentially even device specific behaviors through which we, the towns need to be provisioned. I, I guess I'm just uh, I'm envisioning the abstraction of here's a bunch of nodes with it, and I, and I want adjacencies between them, mm -hmm. and then I want that realized down in my network via a given yeah. technology. So, yeah. so, so yeah. we have not fleshed that out in Yeah, here. fair enough. I have any. <laughs> no, but I guess so many, what I'm trying to understand is if you're only interested in, I mean, setting up the tunnel, then that is what I think Saro described next time. No, so, so but if you're yeah. wanting to say that you want to remember the adjacency in some type of an abstraction, like a crossbar, right? so what, well, yeah. then it is, you are really creating another level of abstraction on top of the network, and then you need some concept of a virtualization. Right. If you're only setting up tunnels um, uh, from point A to B, and you want to pre-specify them, then what is the Thomas is saying or what Saudo is saying, that should be relatively more easy to do on top of a mouse. So, so what I'm actually doing is I'm clarifying my question in my own mind as I describe okay. it. And it, it goes down to how do I create the MQLS cloud to start with? Yeah, what is the vision of what, how do you represent that cloud? And how do I and get it? And it might be a cloud that we actually don't control. Right. right. Or, so how, how do we represent, represent it? Or how do I create it even if we do control it yeah. as an initial thing? I don't know. That's just... Yeah, the question is still being clarified in my own mind. Mm -hmm. And then once the cloud's there, how do you use that in other intents and PCEs to leverage that, that, hey, I get to here, I don't care how you get to the other side, but then calculate the other part of it. So I don't know, I just... So I have visited in my previous capacity, <laughs> we've gone through the similar exercise, and even though we have not actually executed on it, so I'm aware of at least a couple of different possible approaches through which you'll be managed. One of them is actually quite res uh, resembles the the tunnel management as we discussed with Patrick. That's certainly one way to go about it. The other one is more closely resembles the behavior framework or the driver framework, which you're going to be exposed to through OBL. Uh, there's different ways to attack it. We're not at the point where we can attack it, uh, but. That's that's what that dot 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 is for. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is this is by no means a finite list, but in the order of depend in the order of importance or sort of a, not importance, in the order of sort of this is almost like a topological sort of in which we need to get things done in order to uh, to build the system, right? That's what. In order to have intents, we have to be able to have flow rules in order to cascade. So, so, I think, yes. One more minor question. Yes. Uh, the, the link can support the multi access thing. No. Multi, so, link is a. So, yeah, so the question is what do you mean by multi access? So, so wireless, or the link has a host on six ports. Ah, well, so, yes, yeah, so depending on how you model a link, so link, so port could be either a port on a physical device or it could be, a, it could be WLAN on radio. Uh, a port link has a multiple host attached to it, not the one, one point, point to one, point to point. On a radio. On a radio, there are multiple. Points. But it's just one radio. So, and we have, again, we have not done this because uh -huh. this, this ONOS is not currently focused on, uh, on wireless access points. Okay. But, again, but you mean there's some resemblance that. between yeah. this model, because there's a resemblance between what ONOS had and what the HP controller had. And um, I guess maybe naturally, uh, since I'm here, that the, the, the their similar similarity is increasing. And uh, in some cases, I think we're shedding some weaknesses behind. But um, the idea here is to to allow capturing wireless networks to nothing that can be accomplished by modeling a port as a as a WLAN on a radio. Sorry, wrong. Okay. Which is on a specific radio, so so there's no so the notion of the, the WLAN across many radios, right? That that would be a, really a device that has many ports. It's a logical device that has many ports. So oh. At least that's that's how I would model it. That's not necessarily the only way to model it, but it's one way to model it. Maybe you can have a logical representation of a WLAN as a 
is essentially a controlled wireless network which has many different ports on it. What? Must have missing his temper. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of wireless LAN. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Also broadcast domain. Yes. Whole sound switch, whole sound touch. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's really all I had. So any other questions? Sorry, I didn't fill in the whole hour, but. <laughs> So I, I missed the, the earlier part of your hand, I'm sorry, uh, but I don't know if you talk about uh, what kind of a modeling uh, uh, method we're going to use to model, uh, let's say, open daylight with Big Yang, or, and I haven't heard anything about almost what we what, what kind of modeling uh, language we pick. I don't know if you have something more yes. on that. Yes, um, I don't know, is there a red dot right here? No, not right now. Okay, it's, so the idea is to. You're not going to be more great. Uh, so, how do you abstract them? <coughs> so, the idea is right now to, to uh, abstract uh, various network um, and network related concepts, mm -hmm. devices, ports, links, paths, topologies, um, <coughs> flow rules, flow metrics and provide services, uh, APIs, to be able to, to exchange in, uh, them with the system, with the core. Uh, so we're not going to deal with Yang. It's going to be plain Java. It's going to be prescribed. Java. Java, Java is the kind of Java APIs, Java interfaces. For the most part, it will be interfaces. Okay. On a few small occasions, there will actually be classes. Okay. Uh, that, that's the canonical representation of the contract. Focus on the interfaces. Interfaces, Java. Mm -hmm. But how? And, yeah. <laughs> no, sorry. No, I, I keep. I need to learn to take. No, it what I mean, thing, uh, we were talking during the break. Can the devices, or the southbound, the provider thing, can that be model based? I mean, can there be? So, if you go to your whatever that diagram, you have the, the provider. Yeah, maybe this is the one. The green one. So, right. So, can the the Whatever, uh, yeah, maybe the provider, the yeah, here down, can that be model based in some cases? Or um, it, it can, but why would it be only two? No, so for example, I mean, when you were talking, right, if people have built model based uh, uh, implementations for their uh, device plugins, can they fit into this? And does it really break anything about ONOS? Um. I guess that would depend on how what constraints were placed on the model. The, uh, the idea here is this is this is you know the narrow waist diagram that you uh -huh. saw. This actually this is where the narrow waist lies. The idea the, one of the things I forgot to mention about the nature of the southbound API. Notice where it is. The idea is that it sits reasonably far away from the protocol for two reasons. One is so that it does not inadvertently shape any contours of any specific protocol because then it just becomes the protocol library, mm -hmm. uh, right? The last thing we want to do is come up with a southbound API that looks like the OpenFlow J with, without the OpenFlow in it, mm -hmm. right? That's, that would not, that's not the intent of this. And also, it needs to be far away then to be able to allow enough maneuvering room for the providers to be able to, to, to transform these the protocol the specific things into protocol independent and vice versa that because I'm there will be edicts flowing this way also. No, I'm following that. But what I'm saying is that you have multiple providers, right? Yes. Depending on the type of protocol and type of device, so can one provider be model based and another provider be based on? Uh, you know, some they can do whatever they want in the inside <laughs> as long as they talk this this fixed this API that we asked for. What, what is the character, I mean, that's part of the problem I'm having understanding, is what is the characterization of that provider okay. here, so API? The what, what does it look like? Example, so I'm, I'm going to be, sorry Ali, uh, he left, but I'm going to be trespassing into his territory. Okay. And he's, anyway, so we'll cover this again tomorrow, but to, to illustrate the nature of the southbound API. Um, what does Core need to know about API, about devices from the, from in the environment. Hey, I detected the device. Hey, a device vanished. Or de device detected device vanished. Um, 
ports updated, maybe ports they change. It's really all he needs to know. Right, but then there is also some... About the device. Uh -huh. that, that specific topic, okay. Okay. right? And so, so as, as far as the notification about the device, let's say device detected. Okay, so the idea here is that providers do not create the model objects themselves. Right. They create, they write down on these little post-it notes, which are sort of these descriptions of what it is that I see, and they hand it over. It's kind of like a waiter handing, you know, waiter yeah. doesn't cook, he describes the order. <laughs> he hands it over the counter, and that, this is the counter right here, and this is where the cooking happens. And then, um, and from that description will be, dis we will decide, the core will decide, hey, I already saw this device. This is really not a new device. Um, I should just update it. So, so oh, the, sir, uh, the software version has changed. Somebody must have upgraded the firmware. And and so uh, oh, the only thing that will decide then, as a result of this, say, well, device updated. It sends a device update notification over here through asynchronous, uh, you know, listener patterns. If it's a device that it has not seen before, well, guess what? It introduces a device into the system, makes sure that it's properly tidied up, uh, potentially distributed, persisted, whatnot, and then it emits a notification saying, oh, we have a new device, and it has these ports. And similar sort of thing. So that's the type of conversation that's being had with the southbound API, at least on the topic of devices. So how about, like, flow down, pushing a flow down? What, is there like an add, does the southbound provider API specify like add flow, remove flow? So no, I'm sorry, well, so actually pushing a flow would be a downwards motion. So, right. so yeah, so that would, that would be basically a prescription of a flow match action mm -hmm. that gets handed to the provider and protocol agnostic one. And that's, could be the, that's the same one actually. We haven't fleshed that one yet, but that's the, the idea here is that it will be the same one that's exposed over here, gets handed over here, and this guy provides so, so the transformation. So southbound basically API definition, interface definition has a add flow with match yep. action, yep. remove flow, those types of yep. things. Now, yes. Okay. So now with respect to the, yes, yes, so that's the nature of the southbound API. Now with that specific one, let's say the flow rule API that's exposed here, and the intent API that's also exposed here, uh, we might actually make those mutually exclusive. So you either enable one or the other. Uh, because you can imagine that would be quite a nightmare because if the intent framework is itself using flow rules to provision things, uh, intents, which it is, then the last thing you want to be doing is people going around potentially subverting. Agreed, agreed. I mean, so, it, it, that leads me to other questions about how do I add southbound provider API, put that aside. So, so again, <laughs> remember, so that if, you have, if you have specific different set of behaviors that are yeah. not modeled here, let's say you would like to model a food in here, or let's say just yeah. a tunnel. Let's say we don't provide tunnels in November, but Huawei needs to do tunnels in November or, or are short on, on a November code base. Write an API, write a core, write providers. And then you can conform to the same behaviors. You can write your own column of functionality structured in the same, exactly the same way, taking advantage of the core distributed functionalities here. And you can extend the functionality of the controller sideways. So. That goes back to, then let's go back to flow, mm -hmm. a, a concrete example. Flow, add flow goes down to a southbound mm -hmm. provider API. Somewhere that API is mapped to an implementation to a specific, specific device type. Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. So you can send TO, you can use TO1. Right, so does that happen? The core basically says, give me the implementation for a specific device type, or as because the device, that? well, the device is a URI, so it, so we know we became aware of the device from a specific family of providers, from a from a from a from a, from a pro device provider that probably belongs to a family. Let's say we have TO one providers, right? So, so there's a look up there that says. Yes. This URI give me the right provider. I know which flow provider to use, or I know which family of providers to use for this particular device. And that happens through the device yes. driver. So in that regard, it's similar. Uh, this, is, this is similar to the M MD cell in the sense where yes. they have the ability to dispatch downwards request and, and dispatch notifications upwards. Okay. So in that regard, there's a similarity there. Okay. So but, yes. Okay. So. In terms of the models that ODL implements today, there's some similarities the flow model to the flow table, mm -hmm. you know, those type of things important. But it's unclear that without a lot of work, you'd be able to map one-to-one -one and automate, you know, hey, I can take a plug-in for ODL 
that says I support the flow tables and throw it in here. There'd be a lot of work around, I think, doing it. I think there's some, a better reuse model. You're going to, down at the device level, you're going to be calling the same methods, right? You can cut and paste <laughs> code, or even if you wrote, wrote your Java mod, modular enough, there'd, there'd be code reuse. I don't think, without a lot, a lot of work and a lot, a lot of, Flows are supposed to be here. The protocol agnostic flows, those are the ones that have not been cooked for the device. Now, if a provider, so the provider can ask that question anytime. What is it? What is this device supposed to have? But it's going to get the pre-cooked ones, and then it needs to cook them. And so, my point about is this an optimization? If you want, if you're interested, in, if the cooking takes a long time and, and there is some efficiency to be derived by storing the cooked state, by all means, provider can go ahead and do that. That is an optimization. With, that can be accomplished entirely within a realm of the providers. Now, that, that's my thinking. The core, should, core deals with nothing protocol specific nor device specific in a sense, uh, device specific behaviors. So Thomas, do you foresee some kind of acceleration engine perhaps might be needed because of all this conversion to the common format? Um, acceleration? You know, you're saying the core doesn't see any protocol specific on the south panel or the north panel. So, so, so you, you, you mean like information mutates from what it is to, to what right. this is? Right. And what so it already does it today. We already do that today. I mean, it doesn't take that much. I mean, I think no, it's just, it's just, it's just it's object. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just object. If you're doing for it's clean code, code practices. I mean, Guava does it all over the place. Google is, is the idea is to deal with as much immutables across these things as possible. Right. This is everything that flows from here to here is to be immutable. <coughs> Which is going to be treated as immutable. You're going to copy it to whatever format you, the core needs it, right. and it's going to discard it. Just like the cook tosses that pieces of paper that describes the order away. If you want a new one, write a new piece of paper. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah. I know there is a tendency to to say oh, that costs too much money. You know, too much, too much CPU cycle, too much memory, and whatnot, too much garbage. Uh, um, collection or even too much money in terms of developer code because you're writing things only to be code for you know for your objects to go from here to here but that's a, a really easy trap to fall into uh, of optimizing too early it actually leads to safer code we can we, the core now is, is its own separate sort of concerns it deals with uh, there's a protection from malbehaving providers whole slew of other benefits in terms of productivity for developers, unit testing and all that stuff comes from immutability and that sort of approach to things. If you were to optimize, if you were really concerned, if you really thought we could derive performance, uh, then we should be bypassing byte buffers all the way from here. <laughs> right? We don't want to do that. Right? I mean, if you've seen code that tends to do that, like in backups, you know, where you really shouldn't be avoiding but it, it, there's a cost to it. Where do you see this being distributed in terms of multiple instances on those cores or having a, a group of southbound providers supporting one data center and another supporting uh, another or scaling it out and when, you know, how are you doing the RPC mechanism? So the thought is to continue to do what Onos does today, which is that it has a symmetric setup. On, on all of the instances. They're all equipped with exactly the same software, capable to control any of the switch within the realm. Okay. So it's entirely symmetrical, and the idea is to continue to do exactly that. And so any load balancing is really done only on which area of network each, the, 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 each node will control. And right now, it's really just a sort of a treat it as one big vat of things, and then the, 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 the coordination framework will decide who, which controller should be, which switch should be controlled by which controller, and you know, clearly the idea is to be, for it to be load balanced in some way. Um, so once the, the command or the call gets down to the core, it's straight path of the device yep. in process. Yep, and the idea is, is all local procedure calls. So component here, you know, talks to other components here through this API. Yep. You know, because you can have components talking 
you know, for example, a topology will probably need to talk to device service registration, that sort of stuff. Uh, so they talk through the through the mutual interfaces, and apps will talk through these interfaces down here. And if any communication needs to happen between the the um, between the like components on different machines, that's what the inter inter distributed infrastructure is for. That happens from, let's say, you know, device manager talks to device manager on the other. But generally, device manager here should not be talking to link manager over there. Device manager, if it needed to, if it for some reason needed to talk to link manager, would be talking this way and just locally. Keeps it straightforward, very simple. Um, keeps it symmetric with respect to operating only a single controller node or 30 of them. So that's what Onos does today, and then the idea is to continue to do that. So let's say to, to, you know today we use RAM Cloud and we use Hazelcast and we use Zookeeper. Let's say we start, you know we have not fully figured out exactly whether that's the same family of uh, distributed mechanisms will continue to go for forward. Well, let's say, let's for example say that we decide to for some reason embrace Akka. And that would be contained within here. And there's nothing against Akka, it's just, it just, it would be, the idea is to not to let the distributed technology deform the overall architecture of the system. And that applies actually to anything. That applies to OSGI. We do not want OSGI to deform the structure of the system. We want to exploit it, we don't want to suffer from it. South one, so the South one I'm seeing the for the basically for the current the owner's uh, deployment. So the each uh, instance is running the same image, right? Uh, what you call is the symmetry, mm -hmm. right? So the, on the South one, we have so many providers, okay, and uh, so many protocols and the devices, okay. I believe in the field, so the one controller cl clusters will manage a lot of the devices which is coming from the different uh, vendors or the same open flow device, but they have the different the, the pipeline organizations, right? So the, from the deployment point of view, all these uh, providers need to be installed mm -hmm. once we uh, the, the start of the almost, or you have some other uh, the well, so, options so to take care of this. So, well, so this is, we're getting into the deployment by one of the benefits of using Caraf is Caraf uses a Maven a repository uh, uh, as a object repository for, for the bundles. And so if you use a distributed or network resident uh, network repository, uh, uh, artifact repository like Artifactory and Nexus or whatnot, then you can actually point all the instances against that object repository, install the same feature plan and boink, and you have the same software. So you just need to update the bits on one machine and then tickle the system, on tickle each controller node, and they will come up in a symmetrical fashion. So, so that should not be a problem. So unless you, so if you if you're worried about only about the sort of the coordination or making sure that the images remain the same, I think we have a fairly easy solution for that. So if you're worried about the other stuff, then maybe not. But is the bulk of I mean I just wonder whether the if you on every instance if you have all the providers, is the bulk of code most of it is not being used. Is that an issue or is it not an issue? Yes, but it's not a problem. Either that's the that's the beauty of like of like an OSGI framework is that if you need it, okay. right, it'll get loaded. If you don't need it, doesn't get loaded. Is it loaded? Are you right. being loaded on demand or is it the minute I so, download yeah. it? So, 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 so there's the only manual yeah. loading there's so, so there's the only manual loading, but I would prefer at least for the time being not even bring that into consideration. I would so, so so if the concern is about having too much code loaded that is not needed, well, I question whether it's so. It's, so at least the today's structure of ONOS is you, you need open flow everywhere in order to be able to do things, because at any given point in time, a switch may contact any controller, right? And so any controller it needs to be ready to service any switch at any given point in time today. Now. To, because today we don't have any partitions set up for what's, what's possible. Today it's one big vat of devices that connects potentially to all the controllers. And the coordination framework decides who should really be master or not. No partitioning. 
But the idea is in the future, potentially, if you need to, especially if you need to support geographically distributed clusters, we will probably should be some partitioning so that we don't accidentally have the East Coast server <laughs> controlling the, the Menlo Park switches. That probably would not be wise. But again, we're not there yet, and there may be time before we get to that point. But for now, we're going to continue with the module of uh, uh, all the switches against all the controllers. And in that context, we, all the controllers need to have the same setup in order to be able to accommodate any possible switch. I mean, the assumption is that the, the bulk of the memory usage of the controller isn't the load. It's the not classes. the classes. It's the, the instances. It would actually cost you more to load the sources than the classes. Yeah. So I mean, again, yeah. you know, we're looking at what is the what is the static footprint size of a controller versus the dynamic. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Um, it fits on my phone. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, it fits like a laptop with 32 gig. And, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yes. the question is, how small can I make a controller? Sure. Yeah. Actually, um, I'm thinking this issue is, um, is not only the load, the how much code you load, load it. Basically, it's from the southbound API point of view, the owner's point of view. Mm -hmm. So that each time when you when you have when you need to send something, send the notifications to the pro providers, basically you are dispatch the messages to each of the not pro each. providers not uh, you load it, right? Not each, to the one. To the you look up the provider that support a given device, yeah. a given node, and then that method. So it's not a, yeah, it's, it's, you, don't, you, don't, you don't send events to all providers. It's a unicast. It's, it's a, like, I have an open flow switch, I send events. That's what Actually, it's, it's my point. So, so the so the from the southbound the point of view. So the, okay, we have the clusters, right? Each uh, the almost uh, just uh, uh, control and manage the part of the network. Think about this. So if we just uh, load this part of the network providers into this uh, instance, potentially you could see one one case. Once the uh, failures happening in this uh, almost uh, instance, we want to the switch over. Mm -hmm. So what will happen? So the basically you switch over to the instance which doesn't have the provider. No, but, but it does. It does. But it does because all of them have the same software. Yes. Every, everyone has the same software. It's just that the, the software is not activated. Okay. okay. Right. So the connection could be that was my point between acceleration engines to support such things. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> if you probably have to keep an OSGI, even, you know, you need some kind of tolerance extension for that. Because I'm confused on the acceleration thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not afraid to ask, though. Maybe I should ask you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> That's more over here. People, okay. people who have been yeah. for PCP, they do uploading of PCP. I, yeah, I probably need this ambiguation <laughs> AO. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping back to the point, um, now, say, right, I, I knew I knew that context switch. Rolling upgrades, have you thought about how to manage that yet? Or talked about that? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> We want we want the vendors and and uh, and, uh, well, and the you, providers yeah. to be able to have some work to do too. Right? Yeah. I mean the carrier, you know, he's gonna he's gonna upgrade Cornfield, Iowa before he does New York City. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean right, right now the idea is for us to, to do. <laughs> this is a small team. I think we need to stay focused on doing a few things well rather than many things poorly. Yeah, and that's fine. It's, that's the carriers, I assume, are gonna come with that requirement. I'm sure, uh, no doubt, right? I mean, but also also for like, like the best practices in these areas, we'll probably come with carriers. I don't know how many of us here have actually deployed gigantic carrier carrier grade networks. Uh, I haven't deployed large networks, not carrier. So yeah, so I guess the idea is for us to do a good enough of a job where the system doesn't preempt it. Yeah. And I don't because know about Carafe that allows multiple versions of each binary to download. Oh, it's, it's so one of the benefits of OGI yeah. that actually, you can actually load multiple things. Well, but I want to tell this instance to load this version and this instance to load that version. Well, that's a different. Said it has that, well, that's a different. That's a different feature. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so that, that for that you have to have a special consideration also because if you want them to be remaining in the same cluster, and the reason I know is because we had long discussions about this in my previous life. If you want, and this is one of the reasons why we have to be extremely careful to focus the semantic versioning with, with respect to, and everything is based on APIs. Yeah. 
Uh, and also to be, keep control over the serialization here. That the serialization right here is portable serialization across the clusters. Because in order to be able to support the rolling upgrades, you need to make sure that the language that the instance is taught to use over the wire is, is elastic to the point where a new version of the software understands both the new version of the protocol and the old version of the protocol. So they can engage in conversations with the, let's say you have a, you poke the node and say you upgrade first, you go first, yeah. And only so he, uh, you know, evacuates the workload, goes down, software gets upgraded, he starts up, says okay, give me my work back. But in order to ask for that and to, to join the cluster again, it needs to be able to engage in conversations with the, with the guys that know nothing about this new dialect, right? And so, no, we have not thought about it, but yes, we have. Okay. <laughs> but we're not probably going to be taking any action. Not in November. No, for sure. <laughs> so the provider, let's say I have uh, multiple providers, one is for SNMP, another for NetCon, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Each provider is a bundle, or they are, like, you have a smaller container inside this Yes. So bundle is a jar. Yeah, it's bundle a jar. is a jar. Right. And and whether or not you decide to deliver a whole family of <coughs> providers down here, for let's say all of these all different of providers, you can deliver them in one single jar, no problem. Go, go right ahead. But clearly, uh, providers from different originating entities, let's say one from Onos, will probably be different one and one from NTT. Yeah, just uh, you know, because let's say I have a separate, like, let's say I have a two jars, but which means that API I provide is a form to different job, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the provider API. So does the, uh, no, the... The API is one. The, the, the <coughs> comes, this comes with Onos, this comes with Onos, as a matter of fact. Yeah. So there's a, the Onos supplies one API bundle which contains both of these tiers in it. Okay. And then Onos will supply a series, one or more bundles that will implement the core. Right. And Onos will also supply the built-in open for providers, which you just, if you don't want, you can yank them out okay. and put your own. Your own okay, own. so the API itself is uh, some kind of a bundle. In just one, one yes, bundle. Yes, bundle. Okay. And Onos then API. I provide but the talk to that. Okay. But is it multiple Understand. interfaces? Can I provide oh. one jar that supports the discovery of a device and right. one jar that supports the push down the flow? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I separate uh, that? Is uh, that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, no, it's no, no, yeah. No. You because can. I was thinking originally, I was thinking, you know, the API is uh, inside my bundle. But if uh, API itself is a bundle, uh, that, yeah. So that makes sense. in here, you know, we have uh, we have a component. So we have one of these it's almost OF provider device. Right. So one component that ignites, subscribes to notifications from the, the OpenFlow API, right. and feeds information via device provider service to the core. Simple as that. And if you decide to put, we could put all of the open flow providers into one bundle, no problem. It's just a choice that you make, how segmented you want to make it. If the code is too big, probably segmented. If, if the concerns are reasonably distinct, segmented, why not? Doesn't cost anything. And the idea is with Caraf, uh, and this is you know one of the good choices that ODL made to go with Caraf, is they uh, support very, easy way to aggregate bundles into these sort of high level features that you can then deploy and undeploy as one and then and you can easily track versions and all of that stuff. And so we we intend to do the same. Alright, so now I spoke way over, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, thanks for all the questions. I guess we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.